report of Alexander Dudnikov we will put in, into the next session. Okay. After, after lunch, to save more time for lunch. lunch. You'll be Pacific. 
And so I'm going to be describing how you can compare species that are in the North Atlantic to species in the Pacific. Because if you want to know questions about your species, you need to know where it came from and what the ancestor of your, of your uh, animal looks like. And, and, that's, and that's what's so important about the Northwest Pacific is that um, we can, uh, we, working together, we can identify the closest relatives in the North Atlantic so that we're making the correct comparisons between the uh, closely related groups. So all of these um, species that I've pointed out have all come from the Pacific. So let me just be a little more specific about that. <coughs> so the Transarctic Interchange happened when the Bering Strait opened up. So for about 40 million years before that, the Bering Strait was the Bering Land Bridge. There was no, no, um, no marine pathway through there. So the, the whole North Atlantic and Arctic, there were no glaciers in those days. Um, the, this whole area here evolved completely independently from this area here. So when the Bering Strait opened, it's just a little, it looks like just a little strait, but it led to the huge invasion from the Pacific to the North Atlantic. And in a, 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 the top there, I point out that every time that biotas meet, there's always an interchange, and it's always in one direction. So when the Suez Canal was built, in, uh, there was a big exchange between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. And almost all the animals came from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Very few went in the other direction. So this unidirectionality is, uh, is an interesting and difficult question to study. But in order to study it, we can't just look at one species or two species. We have to look at many species. This general principle of unidirectional interchange is also true in terrestrial organisms. So when North and South America came together three billion years ago, they call it the Great American Interchange. Because in America, we always think we're so great. So America uh, is, the, is the, the, great inter, the Great American Interchange. And that was all from North, North America to South America. So we have theories about why it's unidirectional, but I'm not going to spend uh, more time on that because um, I, I don't have any good answers. I can tell you that it's not because of ocean currents. Um, and we can talk, I'd love to discuss that more with you later. Before I leave this slide, I want to emphasize that when the Bering Strait opened three and a half million years ago, there were no glaciers in the Northern Hemisphere. So temperate species were able to cross to the North Atlantic very easily. And then when northern glaciation came along, it, it, um, it made it more difficult to get between the oceans for, um, for temperate species. Okay, so here's, here's, um, how, the, um, here, here's how the transarctic interchange worked. Um, all of these species here, uh, all of these genera, are all represented um, uh, in the Northwest Pacific. And before the Bering Strait opened, they were all confined to the North Pacific. That's where they were. They, but then when they, when you, um, when the Bering Strait opened up, it led to the, a, great, a huge invasion to the North Atlantic. And so, this is a great is is a model system for biogeography because this interchange put closely related animals and seaweeds on four coasts in the northern hemisphere the northwest atlantic the northeast atlantic the northwest pacific and the northeast pacific because as evolutionary biologists 
we believe in the comparative method to compare between, um, between organisms. And these oceans are very different. The, um, uh, the Pacific has a much lower salinity than the North Atlantic. So right there, there's a, there's a big difference. Um, and so we can ask, what happens to these species when they move to the North Atlantic? Do they evolve? Do they make new species? We can investigate that because we, we can figure out what their closest relatives are in the Northwest Pacific. But if we don't work together, then we can't study this because you might have noticed that Russia is almost all of the is all of the Northwest Pacific. So if you're an American and want to study the North Pacific and you don't work with the Russians, you're making a big mistake. So that's why I came here to um, to get uh, people interested in this in this perspective. Patterns that we see. Because again, when we look at a model system for biogeography, we have replication. And that's what you want in an experiment. You want many different cases of a similar, you want to see if there are repeated patterns in different taxa. And this describes Middleus Edulis, um, how it came from the Pacific. Everything came, the, and that's Vladivostok here, the big star. Um, so uh, when, when the transarctic invasion started three and a half million years ago, this was the first wave, the first invasion from Middle East to the North Atlantic. And then after Middle East Edgelis arrived to the North Atlantic, there was a speciation event in the North Atlantic where Middle East Gala Provincialis and Middle East Edgelis became separate species from one another. So that's one pattern, where you had an early invasion, it's been in the North Atlantic for a long time, and you had one new species created. <coughs> the other pattern of the Middle East lineage has to do with repeated invasions. So it didn't just invade the Atlantic one time, it invaded again. Middle East Trosilus, which of course is the Northern Pacific Middle East, invaded again quite recently, probably 100,000 years ago. It, it invaded the North Atlantic again. So here we have one lineage that has invaded the North Atlantic more than once. And there are other lineages that never went across at all. So that's another interesting question. Why did some species participate in this invasion and others did not? And some lineages came over many times while others didn't come over at all. So again, this is something that we can ask if we compare many different species to one another. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to move on to some of the other animals that I had in that, in that little drawing. And I'm going to be asking, what, what are the patterns of speciation that happen um, in these other lineages? So when they arrive in the North Atlantic, do they form new species or not? Do they have speciation events in the North Atlantic? So um, we can ask this about uh, Macoma baltica. This is my colleague uh, Risto Vainola. And this is another species, that, another lineage that has invaded the North Atlantic more than once. So we might ask which, why some lineages and not others? And as I said, we want to be able to make the comparisons between the North, the North Atlantic members of these genera to the North Pacific. But many times, the North Pacific has 10 species. And the, America, the Atlantic only has one species. So we need to be able to identify which species in the North Pacific are the closest relatives. And barcoding is perfect for this. 
because it's a, we're looking at a very recent history, only three million years, and so barcoding can help us identify which species are the are the closest. So, for example, um, I've studied hermit crabs for many years, and I've there is one lineage that invaded the North Atlantic of hermit crabs, um, and I wanted to know what's the closest relative, but I had never, uh, I, I didn't have any samples from the Northwest Pacific. I collected a few hermit crabs in the Bering Sea, but I'm not a very good taxonomist, so I'm not sure if, if this, what I called opotensis really is. But when I went to GenBank, I found the work of Dmitry Apopkin, where he had done um, barcoding for most of the, the hermit crabs in the North, Northwest Pacific. So I was able to add the Atlantic species and then identify which was the closest lineage. And what I found there was that the Bering, the Bering Sea samples that I collected are closer to the Atlantic, um, the Atlantic species than they are to the Northwest Pacific. But that's an example where we need to know um, more about, about the, um, the close relatives. So there are, um, there are three different patterns of speciation when they arrive in the new, in the new ocean. So Littorina obtusata is, is a North Atlantic species, and it's a member of four, of a, of a species group of four different species. So there was a small adaptive radiation when this lineage of Littorina arrived in the North Atlantic. So if you're interested in adaptive radiations. This is a species that experienced one, and if we want to ha help understand why some species have a radiation and others do not, we want to look at these patterns to see what other lineages have multiple, um, have, have a multiple new species uh, form. As a comparison, the Littorina Littorina lineage which is um, related to Littorina sitkana. That lineage arrived in the North Atlantic and no speciation. So it's the same genus, but it had a completely different speciational history when it arrived in the North Atlantic. So again, those are the kinds of comparisons that are interesting if you look at many, many comparisons. The second pattern is the one that I mentioned in Middleus where you have one speciation event after they arrived in the North Atlantic. So Gallo Provincialis was, was a, a, a new species that separated from Middleus edulis, and so there's one speciation event. Um, we have Asterius, your, your Asterius amarensis, that was the, the ancestor of our North Atlantic um, species, and there was one speciation event in the North Atlantic between Asterius vulgaris and Asterius rubens. So all of these species that have, um, that have, are in blue here, arrived in the North Atlantic and then had a speciation event. And the red ones are ones that arrived in the North Atlantic and had no speciation within the North Atlantic. So they might be a different species than the North Pacific, but only one lineage has survived in the North Atlantic. So again, if you're interested in speciation, this is a model system that we can look at, and we can, um, we can compare many different species. This is only a start, but if we looked at 100 species and identified these patterns, we might be able to say, well, this is why this, this lineage experienced multiple speciation events, and this lineage didn't. But in order to do that, you have to look at hundreds of species. So when I say it's a grand vision, it's just that you, to do biogeography properly, you need to do hundreds of species. And so in order to carry out this research program, you have to do the whole ocean. You can't just do a couple of lineages. Or at least that, that's what I'm arguing here. <clears throat> I'm going to end uh, talking about the um, the cod lineage. Can, can, what's the Russian word for cod? Triska. 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 
Um, and cod is very well studied. When, when I started working on cod, they know everything about cod. They know when they mate. They know, they, they observe the mating events, hundreds of them. And so they, they know a tremendous amount about these, this group. So I'm going to show you a couple of tricks that we can apply to cod, but there are also tricks that we could apply to other species as well. So I just want to give this as an example of how we can, um, we can make ecological comparisons between these, these areas. So to ask if the ecology of a species when it arrives in the North Atlantic, does it change relative to the Pacific? So to, the first thing I want to point out is that, remember I said that all that almost all the invasion happened from the Pacific to the North Atlantic? Well, I lied to you. There is the cod, which started in the Atlantic and then invaded the North Pacific. So it went in the other way. But, um, so the lineage number one here started in the North Atlantic. And then these arrows here show different events of moving between the oceans. So the first, the first uh, invasion happened when the Pacific cod, Gaddis macrocephalus, was established in the North Atlantic. So, I mean the North Pacific. So it, it arrived here from a Gaddis morhua um, ancestor, and, uh, which is the Atlantic cod, and it established the Pacific cod. Then, another lineage, the Alaskan pollock, Theragra Chalthograma, now it's known goddess, um, I'll, I'll explain that. That happened, it was a second invasion of the North Pacific that happened about two million years ago. And so we can ask, here we have two invasions of the North Pacific from the same lineage. They both came over from this Atlantic cod lineage. And we can ask, how, have, how do they compare in terms of what happened to them in the North, the North Pacific. So we can study this by looking at range maps and constructing what we call ecological niche models. So the way this works is that you need to have a, um, a, a georeferenced database that for every different spot in the North Atlantic it's associated with information about depth, how deep it is, what the temperature is, what the maximum temperature is, the minimum, does it ice over or not. Um, and it turns out that, that each of these little dots here, that's, I'm, I'm using those as examples of, of locations. You don't need to sample a million individuals to construct a good niche model. Sometimes you can just do 30 uh, locations across the North Atlantic and then come up with a model that works pretty well. And the way we can test that is by applying the model that we get from these points up here and then predicting the distribution of the species. And of course it's totally circular, right? So it's not that surprising that we're able to recreate the, um, the Gaddis Morhua uh, range from this ecological niche model. Okay, so we have the parameters of how deep they go, what the temperature is, what salinity they like, and from those we can predict what areas of the North Atlantic it should live in. And of course, they're the same areas where we find them. So that's a, the simple part. But then, what's really fun about this is that we can apply this same ecological niche model and say, where else in the world could these guys live? So we can apply the same model that works in the North Atlantic to the North Pacific and ask, where would it live if it invaded the North Pacific? And the answer is right here. So it's got this distribution here. It just goes down to uh, Northern California. And then on this side, it comes um, if, if the Atlantic cod invaded right now, this is where we would predict that it would live. 
not only in the North Atlantic, but there are places in the North Pacific that it could live. So this is, a, so this is called predicting suitable habitat. Where else might we find suitable habitat? And you'll see in a moment why this is important in asking if you've had an evolution in, in an ecological niche. So here is an example of comparing the two lineages that split three and a half million years ago. The Atlantic cod and the Pacific cod split from each other right when the Bering Strait first opened. And if we take the gaddis morhua model, which I just, we just talked about, where we take the, the Atlantic locations and figure out what the parameters are that predict where we're going to find it. And then we, um, we, we do the same thing with macrocephalus, the Pacific cod. We look at samples in the North Pacific and come up with a model that explains why it's found where it is in the North Pacific. But then we can apply that model to the North Atlantic and said, if the Pacific species invaded the North Atlantic, where would it live? And we see here that the model predicts that Pacific cod would have a range that is very close to the range that where Atlantic cod is. And there's another, um, this is true also if you reverse them two. So if you, so this is the um, the actual range of the Pacific cod. Now we're looking at the Pacific, of course. Um, so, uh, so this is the actual range of the cod. Uh, no, sorry, the Pacific, there we go. This is the actual range of the Pacific cod. But the model for Gaddis morhua, if you if you apply it to the North Pacific, this is really close. That the that the ecological niche that we find for the Atlantic cod is almost identical to the Pacific cod. So that means that for three and a half million years, these two lineages have the same niche, if you want to define that by depth. The second invasion was by Theragra, um, which uh, now, now it's put in, uh, in the um, in Gaddis, but it looks so different from the other cod that it was given its own genus. And if you look at the range of Theragra in the North Pacific, because they're they're a North Pacific species, and compare it to and compare it to the um, compare it to the the actual range of the Pacific cod, these guys live in almost exactly the same areas. So when Theragra came over from the Atlantic, it didn't change its ecological um, distribution, but it did change its morphology. So um, I'm not a fish expert, but this, this species was so different that they gave it its own, its own genus. So this is an example where the ecological niche parameters stayed about the same, but the morphology changed. So I just wanted to... Um, just end on that note that by applying some of these ecological niche models, and we can apply these to hermit crabs, we can apply it to anything, it's just that the, the fish um, databases are very good right now, and you can, you can just go to fish base and, and, and find these things. Um, and we can, uh, we can ask how often is an invasion associated with a change in niche, and how often is it, is it associated with a change in morphology? So I hope I've given you some, um, some ways of thinking about your biota here in the Northwest Pacific and how important it is to people like me who want to make comparisons to other areas, the Northeast Pacific and the North Atlantic. And, um, and we can't do this without active collaboration with people who know the animals, who work, we, we need ecologists, people who study the animals, because when I look at the genetics, I can only create the skeleton. To put flesh on that skeleton, we need morphologists and we need, um, we need ecologists. So that's my grand vision, and uh, thank you again for inviting me to Vladivostok. I've really enjoyed being here.
have uh, a few time for a question. Is anyone? Okay. Uh, could you please uh, suggest, maybe you have uh, approximation, how many species may be in such a research? Uh, bilateral uh, pairs of species. Uh, how, many pair, how many pairs? Yeah. Um, I say probably a, at least a thousand uh -huh. <laughs> a, a, across the invertebrates and the vertebrates. Um, I, 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 th this hasn't been studied in enough detail outside of the fish and the mollusks. The mollusks have been studied quite well, um, and there's you know maybe 20 or 30 mollusk pairs that you can find. But there's if you look at everything. You find many of these pairs, but but the exact number I, I I like to say a thousand, but maybe it's not quite that many. But it's enough that we can make a lot of we can come up with generalities. I believe. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. And much to think about that in the prospect of future collaboration. Your talk was based mainly on the societal animals like uh, invertebrates uh, that are either attached or uh, the ability of slow movement and uh, when you talk, uh, you finish the talk with a uh, pelagic species mm -hmm. so uh, and uh, just drastic just differences in ecology uh, and uh, did you just try to figure out uh, well, in the perspective of bottom versus pelagic species mm -hmm. uh, how many pelagic species, what in a proportional way, are uh, invaded from the Atlantic to the Pacific and uh, from the Pacific to the Atlantic compared to the book? Um, uh, as with others, most did come from the Pacific. And, and you're right that I, I pull out the fish at the end, which are very different from the sessile invertebrates. And that's because I move where the data exists. And the fish researchers are so good at cooperating, for one thing, you know, there's many organizations that, between Russia and the United States, that study the fish together, uh, especially the, the commercially important fish. Um, so, so you can just go to fish base and generate these models. Um, but we should be able to do a similar thing with, with the sessile invertebrates. But the problem with doing that right now is that we don't have good um, ec ecological information about all of the shallow water, surprisingly. So we have to come up with a different, have another map near shore intertidal region. And it's, it should, it's not impossible to do, but you can't just take the fish, the fish um, parameters and try to apply it to the hermit crabs and the other species. But, but it's something that we can do. Um, so, so yes, there, there are very different groups they have very different ecologies, but I think we can study them all. Any question? I have two questions. One, one question. Uh, what do you mean when you say lineage? It's group of uh, individuals or species. What do you mean, lineage? Okay. Um, I didn't want to use the term species because if you're talking about something that's been there for three million years, then we don't want to say it might be a different species now than it was when it started, but it's a continuous lineage. Mm -hmm. It's got a continuous ancestor descendant thread. So that's what when I talk about lineage, that's uh, what I mean. Second uh, question uh, When you used models, you used uh, physical parameters, yes. depth, temperature, and other. Mm -hmm. uh, you've Pay, atten pay attention on uh, interaction with related species in uh, this place. Mm -hmm. uh, ecological. No. When you study interaction, uh, mm -hmm. model interaction in, with re related species in other place. Yes, so um, you're, you're correct that these, para the, these models focus on physical parameters. Because they're trying to say, well, how much of, the, of what we see can we explain just with physical parameters? Forget about interactions, forget about predation. How much can we see from this? And it turns out we can say a lot just from the, Pacific, from the, um, from the physical parameters. But to have a full understanding, we do need to know 
more about the interactions with other species. And again, that's why ecologists have to be a part of this partnership or else it's not going to work. Because they're the ones who can give us the addition. I can just go to a map and find out my ecological niche model, but that's not, as you say, it's not a full description of the, of the, of the species. And the last question. You said, Sorry. My question is too simple, but you did, almost didn't mention about the ground. How did you inf infer which lineage is ancestral or which is descendant? Which kind of uh, characters? And so on? <coughs> In many of these, we have a we have a good fossil record of the the, the mussels and the and the, the snails, so that we can say, we can see that they've been in the North Pacific for a very long time. And then you, can, you have fossil beds in Iceland, and they all show up right at the same time, three and a half million years ago. So you can, in the fossil record, you can identify exactly when these, line, these lineages came over. And so when I, when I say ancestor, you're correct in questioning that, because I'm really talking about sister group relationships, but we can make an inference about which was the original, the original uh, state. And that's why I call the Pacific the ancestor. Or in the case of Cod, the Atlantic was the ancestor. Okay. The very last question, briefly. Okay. Uh, when you built these maps, yes, you use the well, current situation, yes? The modern situation. Today's yes, that's right. Uh -huh. Present situation. But when we try to reconstruct all the process of migration, yes, mm -hmm. does it mean that there was some process when some uh, area suitable for the certain species or certain, the certain lineage migrated over the board mm -hmm. from the initial place to the eventual place, or this lineage, yes, uh, migrated through unsuitable territories. Ah, okay. So, mm -hmm. huh? Right, that, that, you're correct that if we look at the current situation, we might not see the ability of species, and right now it looks like unsuitable habitat. And in fact, for many of these, it's a bit of a surprise that, they, that they're able to come across because they don't necessarily have Arctic distributions now. But one thing we can do with these models is we can go back in time to the last glacial maximum and say, well, what do these models predict about 20,000 years ago? And that's what I show here, that it, it's, it's still found on both sides of the ocean um, back then. But, but yes, uh, uh, we, we, we do have to make inferences using current information, but keeping in mind that it can change. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.